What's up, guys? It's DJ back again with another video. I'm here with a friend of mine, Mac, Big Mac, Mr. Mac. Uh, he is my middleman for all my grading needs. Uh, I've probably talked about him before, or at least his business, the Hurricane Collective. Uh, I'll leave a link to his website in the comment section below. So if you want to check it out, um, he's probably one of the most passionate and most knowledgeable persons, people that I know um, in this game in regards to grading and stuff. So I thought it'd be a good idea to actually talk to him. Yeah, you are, man, you are, 100%. Um, to talk to him and share his knowledge with you guys. And um, we're gonna do like an interview style kind of video where I have a whole bunch of questions to ask him through my phone. And um, we also got some Facebook questions that uh, I gathered up just like, you know, in the last 24 hours that I thought would be cool to go through as well. So um, if you are from the Hurricane Collective Facebook group, um, chances are you'll see your question be asked and Mac will probably answer it as well. So um, that'll be probably towards the end of the video. So if you wanna skip all the other stuff, feel free to do so, it's up to you. Um, but yeah, I thought, uh, I just wanna say thanks again for, you know, coming on and giving your time to do this video with me. Um, well, welcome, man. I'm just moved to the window so that uh, the reception stays pretty good. Cool. Even if it doesn't, uh, should be all right. Um, so, yeah, as I said, uh, I really trust uh, his service. He's probably one of the best. I've uh, talked to a few middlemen before and 100%, uh, I, I send all my stuff to, to Mac. Um, so if you are interested and you're in Australia, feel free to, you know, um, you know, ask him questions as well. Like he, he's probably very uh, approachable as a person. Like um, the first time I graded a card was uh, probably the Charizard that I showed many times on the channel. And um, I was nervous with sending you. it. Yeah, I, I was nervous. I had to ask him quite a lot of questions and he gave his time and he always answered him. So um, that's why, you know, I 100% thought this is a good guy to talk to about this kind of thing and share his knowledge with you guys, share his wisdom. So um, before we Do really, get, yeah, <laughs> before we really get into, um, I guess, uh, some of the hardcore questions, uh, I thought we'd just do a bit of introduction to Mac, give us uh, some of your background in this. Um, like, how long have you been doing uh, middleman service, and um, what makes you, you know, what makes you still do it? And yeah, what what are your thoughts? Yeah, cheers, DJ. Um, thanks, uh, thanks for having me on, and yeah, hi to all your your subscribers and viewers. Um, but I started, I guess, really doing this professionally, um, if you you know consider it professionally, uh, in January this year. Um, <clears throat> And it was just before sort of, you know, um, everything went a bit crazy with COVIDs and all that kind of stuff. So it's sort of, I was, I was getting almost steered away from it almost a little bit. Um, everything seemed to keep uh, popping up as issues and there was hurdles keeping um, <coughs> cards from, you know, getting sent to PSA. At one stage they said, please don't send us any more cards. And uh, Beckett remember. was very similar. Um, mm -hmm. So we wondered whether we were, were even going to continue doing it. And um, basically we just sort of thought, well, once they allow us to send cards back again, we'll, we'll continue on. And, and I had a really good group of um, uh, guys and girls behind me who offered that support early on to sort of motivate me to sort of do it. Um, very similar to yourself, they wanted someone they could trust and, and someone who, I guess, shared that passion about grading cards and... and not just grading stuff for money, but, you know, encapsulating something that, you know, someone's probably had since childhood, you know, they want to have it in a, in a case and, and showcase it off and, and protect it. Uh, and it may not be the most valuable card, but that's fine. Um, so we've continued on since, like I said, January. Um, we've almost, almost hit the 5,000 um, card mark, which is a really good milestone for us. Um, as a, um <laughs> And I owe that to uh, a lot of the guys like yourself who've, who've trusted me to uh, provide that service. And it's, it's been a lot of fun as well. You know, you get to uh, meet um, a lot of people. You get to see a lot of really fantastic cards that 
probably wouldn't have seen before and help people, you know, reach those goals. That's awesome. Um, congratulations on the nearly hitting the 5,000 card mark. Um, I'm sure there's we get. plenty more to come. <laughs> um, yeah, obviously, uh, you also sell stuff as well. You don't just um, grade stuff as well. So what other TCGs do you sell and can you grade like? Um, so it, it initially started off as just grading. Um, there was there was no, I was at home. Um, there's a little bit of a running joke on the on the group that um, you know I operate from the lounge room and certain things like that, which is a bit of a something we have a laugh at. But um, eventually it became so I guess not complicated, but there was a lot going on, and um, there was just cardboard and graded stuff all over the house and. We come to a point where I thought, oh, I've got to get an office or a, a store or something going. So we, you know, searched around and I found something um, quite small, quite affordable. Um, obviously, the, the climate at the moment, not everyone has a huge amount of cash. So mm. I didn't have to have a huge building to operate from. I just needed enough space where I could store people's collectibles safely and, and I guess, you know, use computers and do paperwork without like, you know, the cat walking all over it and stuff. So, um, but in saying that, a lot of people hit us up and said, well, hey, if you got uh, like product that I can, you know, open and, and grade with you and certain things like that. And we've done that previously with, with other groups as well that I've been in, uh, yeah. live break and that. Right. And, uh, and I thought, not. Um, so it was a slow process. We didn't rush anything, but we hit up some, some companies and suppliers and, explained our position and support came from them in, in the way that they were happy to supply us with products for, for cool. people. So we've got Yo, uh, Dragon Ball Super, and, and um, we also spend a bit of time searching for uh, like niche products like uh, Shikishi artworks that uh, from um, Pokemon and Dragon Ball and certain things like that. Yeah, I have seen some, um, you know, like Simpsons stuff and like Power Rangers and is that from you as well? Like all, all those um, various? We went, yeah, we went through a little bit of a phase where minis were like all of a sudden the in thing for, for me for like three weeks. So I just like loaded up and bought all these different varieties of like mystery mini boxes and stuff. And oh. we had a bit of fun. We broke a few open and um, I don't think it's something that's going to stick around like mm -hmm. us personally for a long time. But yeah. Um, it just depends what people want to see, really. Um, I think a lot variety, of yeah. I've seen the Rick and Morty, some NBA stuff as well. Yeah, yeah. It's a hard to get into the NBA stuff. It's, uh, I mean, I I haven't got anyone that can supply me like cost level NBA cards for people, which is disappointing because you watch people have to spend all that money because people jack the prices up, and it's you know that's why another reason why I started doing this was. Uh, that kind of thing really bothered me <clears throat> and I wanted to have people be able to visit somewhere where they knew that they would get a good service I know the person you know behind the uh, behind the the sign so to speak and yeah like get themselves some fairly priced goods and and be able to grade that as well if they wanted to that's awesome because uh, a lot of middlemen that um, that do this generally just grade but it's nice to know that you have products as well. And, um, you know, you do those breaks and give people a chance to, you know, grade through those breaks as well. So that's really helpful. Um, I guess we'll go through some of the questions I've sent you as well. So you can prepare uh, that you, yeah. <laughs> so um, first question we got, um, why should people grade their cards and what cards should people grade? I know you partially answered this before, but um, why not just do it again, I guess. It's, um, yeah, <clears throat> it's quite a like it's quite an open-ended question. Um, if people people often ask me, they're like, well, "What do I do? Like, I've got all these cards in this binder, and and uh, do I grade them all?" And they they really they're not sure what to do. They're like, "I, I think I want to grade everything. Uh, I know it's expensive, and my advice is to sort of really the one focus on why you actually want to grade something." Um, for example, I, I may have, um, you know, this card here. I may have had it from when I was a child and 
but it could be bent in half, basically. It could be worth not much at all. Um, that doesn't mean I can't grade it. It's not going to grade well. But if that person just wants it encapsulated for display purposes, then by all means, I sort of say to them, that's fine if that's what you'd like to do. But you do get odd customers who say, well, I just want to want to grade 15 cards and I want to sell 10 of them and break even and keep these five. Perfect. That's, that's a really good way of doing it as well. Um, but that's when we go into the next step of the process and say, okay, so you want to grade all these 15 cards. If you're going to sell them, um, there's 10 out of the 15 that aren't very worthwhile grading because then we go into whether they're damaged, how they can grade and that kind of thing. So um, some people aren't bothered. They just, they just want to grade their 20 cards per month um, because they want to build up a really huge collection and, and, and have a good inventory and that's cool too. Um, but if you want to grade your cards, um, it does protect them. It does give them a, a more accurate market value, so to speak. Um, this raw card here is worth what I say it is, but to you, it is not worth what I say it is. It's worth what you say it is. However, a graded card as a PSA 10, there's sold listings, there's values that we can use and check and, and we can both come to an agreement on that. Wow. Awesome. I a hundred percent agree with everything you said, uh, obviously, you know, either for protection or for value and, um, yeah, I can't, um, go any further into that. So yeah, well explained. Um, we'll go to the next question, I guess. Um, what's the difference between grading cards yourself versus grading with a middleman? I think this might be a very common question that a lot of people, why do I need to send my stuff to this guy? Why can't I just send it straight there? I guess there's a lot of um, uh, hidden stuff that people don't really realize or notice. So go ahead. Um, I, think the, I think the big one is time. I've got a lot of customers and, and, um, and guys who are like supremely proficient at grading their own cards. They could easily do it, um, but they're busy. You know, there's things going on. Um, they've got lots of valuable cards that they would love to get graded. However, there may be reasons why they choose not to use certain um, services that are available to them. Um, but I've got a lot of guys that come to me and say, well, look, I, I know how you do business and, and I know that I can trust my collectibles with you and that's why I'm going to give them to you. Um, they're also not silly. They know what it costs. They know mm. turnaround time. They know what needs to be done for the cards. Um, so they don't need someone to necessarily tell them how to do it. They just need someone they can, trust, do it properly and be honest. Mm. Um, whereas there's other customers who are like, I've never done this before. Mm. Um, no idea what I'm doing. Please help me. And that's fine too. And that's where I can step in and say, okay, um, how many cards do you have? What are they? Um, why do you want to get them graded? Is there any that you want to keep or sell? Um, are there ones that are like meant in half? Don't send those. Because like, it's going to waste your money. Um, there's, two, there's two variants, I, I think. Um, and that's part of sort of my questions when joining the, the, the group we run, which is solely designed around, you know, having a bit of fun and breaking cards, and, uh, a bit of banter. But it's also primarily a, like a hub where we keep all the information about grading. And the questions are, are you a veteran of grading or are you brand new? Like, I think anyone in the middle probably could use the services of a middleman, but it's sort of one or the other, I think. Yeah. 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 Um, I could imagine it could be um, like the amount of submissions you get would be quite uh, just like overwhelming with um, paperwork, I guess. Um, yeah. um, we, we sort of formulated up some um, documents to help with that. Uh, the submission forms that um, you've actually sort of um, used yourself uh, make such a big difference because you can keep track of everyone's cards a lot easier. Um, there were times when I was getting cards sent to me, I hadn't got any photos from the person prior, I hadn't got a list. Um, yeah. And therefore I was sort of like, well, hang on. Um, yeah. I've got 27. I thought we talked about 20. 
Uh, and so it got, it, at that stage, it was a little bit confusing. Uh, and we did get one month where there was nearly 1,200 cards in the office. Uh, and they were all labelled and put aside. But I sort of looked, I remember looking at that giant stack of cards going, oh, my God, um, I've got to find a, a more streamlined way to do this. So that's where the paperwork side of it came in. We, we were offering probably too many services at one point. Mm. Um, so other middlemen uh, that, that do this um, may offer your standard sort of bulk submissions and, and your economy and that kind of thing. Whereas we were doing uh, Beckett cartoon, Beckett gaming, Beckett sport, PSA, all different. And it just became too much. So we had to, we had to streamline it a bit. And so now we're down to about four services, I think, which is more manageable. Well, we're at that point, um, you're actually probably one of the only ones. Uh, the reason why I found you was actually because I asked um, several groups who does grading for Beckett in Australia, and everyone said you. Like there was no, uh, I feel like there was nobody else doing Beckett here. I mean, I could be wrong, but um, majority of middlemen were just doing PSA. So that's uh, quite interesting to you know. Um, PSA is a lot easier to to grade with um in certain ways the the systems they have in place are extremely easy to use everything's digital and online beckett have started doing that but i know no means of their systems anywhere near the level psas are just my opinion okay. um so the database that they have probably doesn't recognize as many cards as psa um mm -hmm. trying to input the cards into the system uh, if you're doing it with PSA on the computer, the system's very quick to pick up the details of whatever card you're typing in. Um, most of the time I hand write the forms for Beckett, honestly. Um, yeah. And how you submit the cards to Beckett um, in order, uh, generally they move them around anyway. So uh, if I have 150 with Beckett in a yeah. particular order, um, and I know that the first 12 cards are your cards. I need to be really careful and have a really detailed record of which cards are yours because they're not going to come back in the same order. Okay. Wow. That's interesting. That's actually leading into um, one of my other questions, I guess. And that was, what's the difference between grading with PSA and Beckett? And like, do they grade certain cards that the other ones don't? There is. Yeah. Beckett. Uh, I mean, they'll essentially grade anything um if you have a card that psa won't grade beckett generally does do it dragon ball heroes for example um beckett do that psa don't no idea why mm. uh psa will do the japanese bandai pokemon and things like that so do beckett but it's interesting that they have certain genres they don't grade um and yeah it's it's essentially beckett are always known for having uh, i guess a higher you know, they're a bit more harsh with their grades, hmm. which is odd because a PSA 9 card will sell for more than a Beckett 9. Yeah. However, a Beckett 10 can sell for more than a PSA 10. Yeah. That is interesting. Very interesting. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, and the subgrades, like, um, obviously, Beckett does subgrades and PSA don't. Um, People love them. The subgrade thing for sport is a... Uh, Personally, um, doesn't concern me, but apparently it's huge. The the sporting NBA and the NFL market for graded cards. I'm still learning my way through it, and it's a huge, a huge difference to the value of a card if it's got the subgrades because collectors want to know why it's not a ten, or if it's a ten, not a black label, they want to know what part of the card was off. Mm. So, yeah, it is interesting. interesting. Um, uh, do you have to pay extra, for example, to get subgrades on on cards? And yeah, okay. There's like the services you can choose where the subgrades you won't get them unless the card hits a ten. Um, if it gets a ten, even if you haven't paid for them, you'll still get them. Oh, um, okay. And essentially, that's what I suggest people always do with Beckett. It's a far cheaper way to submit cards. Yes, it's not a guarantee because if it's a 9.5 or less, there's not going to be any subgrades on there. But um, 
you, we really shouldn't be sending anything to Beckett that we don't think is going to get a 10 anyway. If you can see something on it, it's not going to get a 10 and they're going to see it. Sure. Um, so, but I mean, people, uh, the cards are their cards and they are uh, free to submit them however they like, but I'll always give that advice to people that, you know, if your cards are pristine, like they should be when you send to Beckett, um, you shouldn't have to pay for the upgrades because you'll probably get them for free. <laughs> Fair enough. That's a good call. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much that covers the PSA Beckett. Um, and, all right. So uh, this one's a juicy one. All right. What are your thoughts on CGC? And should people consider grading with other companies besides PSA and Beckett? Oh, man. <laughs> Where's the can of worms? <laughs> um, yeah, I've had numerous conversations over the last couple of months about CGC, um, primarily CGC. I've never used another grading company aside from PSA or Beckett. Um, and essentially that's because they control the market. Um, mm -hmm. If I want to sell you this card and it's in a Beckett case, you know what that is. You know the prestige behind a Beckett 10 or vice versa with PSA 10. Um, there's a huge database of sold listings for PSA 10s of that card. Uh, I know how many there are in the world, et cetera, et cetera. Um, CGC have only, to my knowledge, just sort of the last year or so started going into trading card. They used to be primarily comics, I think. Um, forgive me if, if I'm not correct fully on that, but I think yeah, it's not right. something. That's what I've heard ages. as well, yeah. No. And look, if you are looking for somewhere cheaper to just encapsulate your collectibles and, and have no concern of market values and later on, it, it's going to have a better value being in a case regardless of what label it is, but it's not going to be as valuable as the high end companies that grade cards. It's just, it's just not going to. And, um, PSA have done what 85 million collectibles over the course of their history. So says their website. Um, so CGC have done what, a few thousand. It's just, it's the, the history and, and the, and the um, proven success is just not there. Um, I do know people sort of said, but it's a quick turnaround, you know, mm. I got to wait so long PSA. That's true. But also, the more people that change their mind and say, oh, well, I'm going to send all my cards to CGC too. And then you're going to do the same thing. And then all of a sudden the office at CGC with maybe 8% of the workforce that PSA has all of a sudden gets overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. uh, and they will handle it. Yeah. An inferior card compared to a Beckett 10, you also got to wait longer too, because they're not, they're not companies like the other two. Mm. So, that's my take. It, it does give a few people the, you know, the proverbials. Um, and, and I know a lot of um, services are providing CGC grading. That's fine. Uh, just personally, it's not one that we're going to provide. Uh, Fair enough. Just don't think the values there. Cool. There is another grading company in Australia, I think. Uh, mm -hmm. I haven't really heard much about them. Yeah. Uh, um, GA, I think, is their card grading Australia. Um, basically, Similar if thing. you the, the grading consistency is is not there with them. Mm. A lot of people say they're getting cards back that are nines or tens, and they're clearly not nines or tens. Mm. And it highlights my point about CGC as well. Mm. They may be really accurate with their grading, but people don't recognize it straight away. You, you may lose money on a deal or a trade or yeah. someone might even look at it and say, no, I don't, yeah. I'm not interested. That's true. Yeah. Very valid points. Uh, I know a lot of people would like extra competition <laughs> or like, you know, a cheaper yeah. option and quicker turnaround. But like you said, if you're looking for values, uh, don't know, don't know if that's going to ever be, you know, I think I think those companies Beckett and PSA are gonna you know they're doing what they can at the moment. We've got to remember the climate we're in too. I mean, mm. if there's something happening, 
the the turnaround times wouldn't be affected like they are at the moment. Yeah. You know, so, I mean, jumping over to a CGC and forgetting about why we're actually waiting seven months for, <laughs> for cards to be graded, a little bit, a little bit dangerous, but also the cards are just going up in value. Like I do say to people straight away when they say, how long does it take? And you're like, well, six to eight months and they go what really yep really so a lot of people sort of go okay i can't wait that long i'm just going to go home and that's fine no problem whatsoever Mm. but i'm not going to say to them oh maybe four months maybe three months because it's not going to be that's false hope um that's what another thing i like about you uh, the honesty as well if it if it's six to eight months that's just how it is i guess um Got to deal with it. Got to. Yeah. Um, and like you said, maybe the value goes up by the time you get it back as well. So, I mean, um, it's a possibility, but never a guarantee, yeah. I guess. But um, what was next? Uh, do you think grading cards has replaced binder collecting? Um, back in the day, nobody used to collect all this uh, Nobody was grading cards, but also sealed product was never really a thing back in the day. And now um, it's either that grading cards or sealed product. What do you think? Uh, no, I think there's still, there's, there's still a home for binder collections. Um, and I was talking to a customer who visited, um, visited the office a few weeks ago with some pretty high end binders. And my advice was, um, look, you could these are all in mint condition you could grade them no, of course you could mm. why why do you want to i mean what you have sorry yeah that's all right. it's okay <laughs> i was um, being called uh yeah uh, there's nothing else like this around mm. um the quality of the cards within this binder you have and to be a complete set. I mean, there may be value in grading the whole lot. Jeez, that's going to cost a lot of money. Mm. Then you don't have them with you. You know, they're all, you know, grading's pretty risk-free really Mm. when you use the um, companies to ship overseas that you should, you take your insurance and and you're using reputable companies like PSA. It's, nearly risk-free pretty much but there is still an element there so to take all those beautiful valuable cards out of the binder and send them away i mean it adds an element of risk there that you wouldn't have had so yeah look i i've got a binder at home cards in it that some of them are gradable some are not but it's the it's the binder set that i have so yeah i think the graded scenes definitely like escalated big time and so is the sealed product yeah Um, but still hanging around i think Cool. I also collect binders as well and um yeah I mean I've always done it so I don't I don't see myself not doing it but that's cool most too. Clean. yeah that's most cool. yeah. old school collectors yeah. yeah um what's the next one is there a potential for a grading company to start grading booster boxes mm. yeah. <laughs> They do sealed packs, but booster boxes. They do packs. They do. Hmm. I mean, Beckett Beckett grades like baseball gloves and baseballs and Hmm. Lord knows what. Look, this it could happen. Um, I don't. I don't think anyone would send their. Yeah, I'm thinking one. Yeah, like minty, fly rich, and base set boxes. Hmm. I don't think. Can't see any reason in not authenticating stuff though. Mm. Um, like the the eighty six eighty seven NBA Fleer box comes to mind. Uh, the guy that was selling that on eBay for like eighty five thousand dollars, and he had a like a certificate <laughs> from um, um, Steve. Uh, what's, uh, what's his name at Beckett? Stating um, like, in my opinion, this is like legit. Okay. Yeah, that's cool. Sort that's of cool. technically the. It is very, yeah, technically the same. Um, yeah, that's not a bad idea, actually. The certificate. All oh, right. I've just heard um, 
you know how there's a lot of sealed collectors out there and they're all like, oh, should we get our booster boxes graded one day and stuff like that? But I thought it'd be an interesting one to just chuck in there. Good to have a certificate um, because I think um, I think there's going to become a time where you can't buy a, a a packet of that 86 Fleer, you know, with Michael Jordan's rookie card. You can't buy a raw pack. Mm. Like there, there will be no listings on it stating that the packs are not potentially tampered with because mm. they're so old and the only ones you can get are graded packs. Um, so maybe, I mean, maybe one day nobody's going to be able to sell a booster without some form of certificate that goes with it. Who knows? Yeah, maybe. Um, maybe, maybe more for sports, but what about for Pokemon? Like, <laughs> do you think Pokemon would come to that kind of, um, quite possibly. I mean, the, the boxes, especially Wizards of the Coast, um, mm. yeah, I mean, you've videos where people buy, you know, even the most reputable um, Pokemon collectors have, have been duped out of stuff before. So, I mean, there's there's guys that know how to do it. But, um, I mean, a Skyridge box for like 50 grand now. Mm. Um, it'd be nice to, like, have communicate with someone and know that you're actually sitting on a legit box. Yeah. Um, most people would know, but, yeah. Okay, cool. Um. All right, so what has been some of the common issues when sending cards away for grading, whether it's from the actual grading company, PSA or Beckett, or from one of your customers sending you cards? Um, pretty simple. Normally it's pretty good. Um, I mean, people sort of uh, enlist me to assist them and, and not everyone has the equipment correct savers and correct sleeves and all of that kind of stuff and um so if i get cards delivered um and they're not in order and they're not in the right sleeves or whatever i swap them out you know i wear gloves and all of that kind of stuff but um we're trying to really get people into the um the habit of sending their cards in um like this um so the reason we do it is because it can't move. Nothing's going to happen to this card inside here. I can get it out if I need to, but the idea is that I don't touch this. I have my gloves on, I unpackage it, and I see that you've done this and they're all in order. I literally can put it back away until I'm ready to input it into the computer. Mm -hmm. um, however, they're in old sleeves. Um, there's no pull tab on it, and especially if they're in top loaders, which... I get that most people have top loaders, not card saver ones, but um, I've had a few cards and we record all of our um, package deliveries so that um, just in case there's any kind of issue with the mail or, or damage. And we've had a few cards that have come out of the top of the car, the, uh, the top loader okay. uh, and, and just been damaged on the top. Um, and of course we've, you know, we filmed it and the customer was able to see that, it wasn't us, but that's why, you know, PSA say don't send us cards in top loaders and so to Beckett for that very reason. Mm. Aside from that, people putting cards in, I guess, like um, a big lot like this, which is fine. And then potentially getting like their expensive one and putting that in like a separate part of the package. Mm. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. So that's always dangerous because um, I've had to recheck packages a few times and found a card in there. I'm like, why, why have you put this in here? Like I nearly threw that in the bin. So yeah, um, it's generally pretty good. Like most people ask um, what they need to do and um, if they need time to, to buy equipment or whatever, we can always supply that here. We make sure that we've got stock that people can use. So yeah. Cool. And the only is that they do move the cards around so that's always tricky yeah uh, the first side we didn't really have a really detailed um i knew whose card was whose but then there were duplicate cards uh, within that and they had all been moved around they weren't in the order we sent them in so mm. challenging that, yeah that would give me a headache <laughs> doing that but 
it is what it is, <laughs> maybe. Um, you know how to dodge it now. Yeah. <laughs> That's good because of your assistant, like the templates that you use now and stuff. Cool. Well, I know you've got the same card, for example. If I've got four of these, um, the initial thought was that I would put yours here and I would put mine way so, up the other end of the form hmm. and um, they'll just put them together. So I put yours first and mine directly behind it. Uh, and that's the order they keep that card in. They may move everything around it, but because these would go together anyway, they'll stay in that that same order. So, makes sense. It's a. <laughs> um, all right. So on another note, I guess uh, we'll go to the next one, and this is the last one out of um, the list I sent you. So we're going to go into the Facebook questions after this. Um, I think we <laughs> you think? Yeah, um, some good ones there. I think. Uh, what do you think the future holds for the Pokemon hobby and the grading scene together? Well, it's, uh, it's unlimited, really. Uh, the potential could be, um, yeah, it, it's, it's unlimited potential. From, from what we've seen in the last um, two years, considering you could, uh, you could buy a first edition unlimited Dark Charizard in PSA 10 for around $400 a couple of years ago. Mm. And now they're $3,000. Yeah. Um, is there anything that's really going to stop it from continuing to go up? Well, no, not really. I mean, <laughs> it's one of the only things that's really not been affected with what's going on in the world at the moment is collectibles value. Mm. Um, you look at the, the hype that has surrounded Zion Williamson, Ja Morant from the NBA. Um, realistically, um, you know Ben Simmons and Luka Doncic were as hyped as as what those these two guys have been. Mm. Yet it's just been differently. Um, is it because Zion is just I don't know better, or people think he's going to be better? I don't I don't think that's the case. I just think it's the way that the world is at the moment, and hobby is at the moment that. Everyone just wants everything that's collectible. Hype is just massive. Um, yes. And I think that's prices as well. Um, so it does make it hard for certain areas of the hobby to be accessed by people. Um, you know, 18 year old guys that maybe don't have full time work want to grab a Don Rosoptic box. Well, it's not going to happen. It's like $580. But um, it doesn't mean that they can't access breaks and, and certain things. So I think there's always avenues that a hobby opening up to allow people to still partake in it, which is a good thing. Yeah. Cause I mean, if a hobby gets too expensive, then a lot of people will probably have to miss out cause they just can't afford it. Um, and I think that's where a lot of new, new TCGs are, are popping up and, a couple of years ago may have not had any kind of hype attached to them whatsoever because people could still access Pokemon and Yu-Gi-Oh and all of those kind of things. But yeah, you've got new TCGs like um, Flesh and Blood, you've got Digimon coming uh, and people are already like wanting cases and cases of Digimon and, and that kind of thing. So um, I think one, one area gets too expensive, people will just move and go for that next area. Yeah, it is interesting. Like, I guess hype can be a little bit dangerous as well. I mean, you could ride the hype train. And um, it was funny how you brought up Zion and Ja Morant because it's also, they've, like, especially Zion, he's only, he hasn't barely played a season. And, like, he might end up being a flop <laughs> of an athlete. I mean, he's probably going to be really good. But, I mean, if he does turn out to be a flop, wouldn't that really affect his card prices later down the track? But, Yep, 100%. Yeah, 100%. I mean, just in Rookie of the Year, uh, mm. if Zion played, would he have won it? He probably would have won it, to be honest, but yeah. <laughs> They're managing the guy because he, you know, he's a huge guy and they don't want his legs snapping off as he dunks. Mm. So, obviously, they're really managing his workload. Um yeah guys that disagree with me and say, no, 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 it's just because the Pelicans didn't do this and that. I'm like, no, no, they would play him if he was 
okay to play. They were being very yeah. careful with him. You know, they were they didn't even let him play the fourth quarter, I believe, in some of the games as well. So um, even though he wanted to, I'm pretty sure. I'm an NBA. <laughs> yeah. They protect him best, mate. Mm. Um, all right, we're going to the Facebook questions now. I just got it uploaded. Um, hopefully, it hasn't been too boring for you. <laughs> no? no, very enjoyable. Very enjoyable. Uh, I, I hope it gives people, uh, you know, some insight into into the hobby that they may not have had. And yeah, always happy chatting with you, DJ. Yeah, man. Um, I guess uh, even after these questions, if people have more questions after this. Put them in the comment section. Uh, we might do another part two of this or something like that, or you know, have another catch up. Never know. Yeah. Happy, um, to, happy to it, mate. give some examples of how to set your cards up, whatever the, whatever people need. Yeah, I mean, I have seen that on your website as well. I that was another thing I point uh, wanted to point out was um, I am linking it down below, but um, with your website, it actually details a lot of things you know how to package stuff and even on, on the facebook group hurricane collective i thought that was really helpful how you know what's the cheapest way to send your cards to yourself or you know like those things are really good like things that people kind of just overlook and um you put that in there so i thought that was really cool um for you to do and to let people know so yeah, yeah for, <laughs> our first video was like um like we did a vote uh, on, on what people wanted like months and months ago and like it was just overwhelming like oh how do I post stuff cheap like because I just waste so much money on postage yeah it happens like especially yes. yeah and that's good that you share that because you know it's helping people send to you and you know vice versa I, I think that was an awesome idea like you know guys make sure you go to his website like it's all there and on the Facebook group Hurricane Collective as well um all right, so some of these you might have answered during the video, but I'll might skip over them. So this one's from Jack. Uh, y grade cards, I think you've answered that. How do you store them in such a humid climate? How do you store them over a long time? Now that's something we have. Yeah. Must be, must be a Queenslander with the humidity. But if you think about where most people have their cards, right? And it's a really good question because most houses have en suites and obviously the shower generating the steam and i know personally my binders and raw cards are not far from where the steam goes and it's it's in the um you know the walk-in robe uh, you can have your cards affected by humidity and steam really easily and wonder why they get warped like wizards of the coast is yeah. renowned warped cards anyway but yeah humidity is not a good thing so i always suggest people just store them in a drawer away from you know any kind of um steam or um yeah uh, especially in the air conditioning um having your binders uh, just it's best to keep them in the dark away from everything um and the cards that's a really good way of great if you grade your cards you don't have to worry about that kind of stuff oh of course not it's yeah it's protected um all right good answer what uh, what do we have next um jaden asks is this something that you would like to do full-time what is your holy grail card i think you already do this full-time don't you you do no the, still, it's still sort of um i guess you'd say at hobby level status like um the amount of cards we've sent away is definitely um been far more than what I expected people to want to uh, entrust me with. Um, so it's been sort of a bit humbling because I didn't, I really didn't expect it to get anywhere near like thousands of cards, mm. but it, it is something that I'd like to look at whether or not it would be viable as something that could be done full time. Um, and whether or not I would get a, a larger store um, and, and stock a large amount of product. But I mean, definitely need money behind me for that as well which is um it's always yeah um uh, so, yeah well, your holy grail card <laughs> um i want an 86 jordan rookie um i'm not even not even greedy like just like a psa 7 would be fine i don't need a 10 um or a psa 10 aquapolis umbreon 
Umbreon. Everyone okay. loves Umbreon for some reason. <laughs> it's a it's a fan favorite for sure. Um, I actually did a giveaway for like an AV thing and everyone voted Umbreon, Umbreon, Umbreon. So I was just like, oh, okay, so Umbreon's the, the best av evolution, I guess. Yeah, I think so. I think more people like it. Jolteon as well. But yeah. Hmm. Yeah, the two. Um, yeah, sorry. I cut you off. What were you saying? No? <laughs> I'm good. Um, so this is from Josh. <laughs> What's his thoughts are on the cultural importance of Spoink in the world of Pokemon and how the TCG would have evolved if we were never blessed with its existence. So Josh, that's um, probably the greatest question that any, any stream will ever hear. No, we have a, we've got a pretty good running joke on, um, on our group where um, it, it sort of pokes a bit of fun at the, the hype train around everything to do with hyper rares and charizards and all these things that everybody wants the same card and then we started up a little um you know sort of showcase area in the group uh where we showcase like psa 10 cards where <laughs> where people you wouldn't think a lot of people had them but <laughs> there's people with like reverse hollow pop twos and um it's it was a bit of fun to actually to do that and make a bit of fun at I guess the you know the hype around you know the hidden fates and the champion paths and that yeah hidden fates and then champions path now obviously so you're probably going to have another spoink session with um, champions path well yeah they should have done a hyper rare spoink not a not a Charizard mm. <laughs> not a Charizard oh okay uh, but I think he has another question here um, but also what did you do before starting up Hurricane Collective and how did you transition. Mm. I was uh, I was a chef in the defence force for quite a while, and then I left the defence force and uh, went to the mining industry as a chef, and um, worked my way towards becoming a catering manager, and then I transitioned into aged care. the The attempt was to come home and um, be with the family more, and so on and so forth. But um, the catering manager role within aged care was uh, <laughs> actually meant I was working more yeah, than what I was when I was away. So um, uh, eventually just sort of decided that um, the, the workload and the management of catering and, and everything else that was going on, I just needed to step back from it. Had some, uh, some challenges with uh, mental health and um, uh, some other sort of um, personal struggles that I got a lot of support from uh, from people around me, uh, and I ended up sort of thinking, really would like to do something with my life at the moment that um, that I enjoy and that I can actually use to help other people as well, which is good. Uh, and yeah, I uh, transitioned back to I guess like collectibles. It's always been something that's been around in my life and that I've enjoyed being a part of. Uh, yeah, so. And the grading component of it didn't start straight away, but I did have a lot of support from those same people saying that, look, you know, if you go ahead and want to try and do submissions for people, we definitely, you know, want to support you in, you know, all our cards here, we want to submit. And <laughs> Here's our card. Yeah, take them. Yeah. Fair enough. Wow. That's a, that's something I didn't know, obviously. <laughs> wow. Lots to learn. <laughs> okay. Um, what's your thoughts on... F oh, this is from Patrick, by the way. What's your thoughts on flesh and blood collectability long-term? Do you think it'll mostly be legendaries and fabled or do you go... Or do you think majestic foils and cold foils might be as well? I have no um, idea about that, so... <laughs> flesh and blood, um, I've actually hyped it up a fair bit when when it was first released i had quite a lot of it in stock and it was not really well known about so uh, it was difficult to move it on and then all of a sudden how they marketed the the game itself and how they did the release of first edition and then also an unlimited which is nearly upon us um a lot of other ttgs 
I mean, Yu-Gi-Oh does first edition, but it's almost like their first edition never runs out. Um, yeah. <laughs> unless the moon came. So, unlimited first edition version for a Yu-Gi-Oh. <laughs> got called again um right. but these guys did different they almost followed suit of the successful tcg so dragon ball super with their their high-end chase cards um pokemon early in the days when it was first edition and unlimited and they sort of combined everything to model a magic sort of related uh diablo-esque type of trading card game so it's almost got bits and pieces of just everything that really works and has been proven to work in the past. Um, and people are starting to really catch on to it and say, oh, hey, well, have, is there any more of that first edition left? And they made a really small amount of it. So the unlimited stuff's coming and that's going to be cool too. But I think certainly it's going to have a value. The cards themselves, the Fable Rare cards, are selling currently ungraded for... Um, over 2,000 Australian, which is oh. just, um, I've, I haven't seen a TCG with such value yeah. behind it uh, in the first year. In the first, first year, okay. I've never heard of uh, flesh, and, flesh and Blood, but now I might have to buy a first edition box from somewhere. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's, um, I, I think it's a lot to do with the, like, the challenges that I mentioned with PSA and Beckett, these guys had the same kind of thing, but mm. they, they stuck to their plan of how they wanted this game to work. Yeah. Um, they, they didn't rush a release of the third set. They didn't bring the unlimited set forward. They just kept it how it was. Um, the unlimited set is a month away still. Uh, and you haven't been able to get boxes for this for at least a month and a half. Wow. Whereas if you think about Pokemon or a, a Dragon Ball, it's like bang, next set. Yeah. It's just constant. Yeah. These guys are they're not trying to shove it down everyone's throat. And I think it's actually why it's worked. I think that's a good thing to be honest. Um a lot of people can't keep up with how much Pokemon keeps dishing out, to be honest. Like every couple of months it's just like another set, another set, another one. It's like ah. But um yeah, that's actually pretty cool how they did that. You know, they looked at other successful companies and they got the best of the best and put it all in one kind of thing in a way. Um, and I mean, they're a New Zealand based company. Um, the cards are um, produced and printed in Belgium. So, I mean, they're really good quality. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's designed to be successful and, and I think they've got it right. Cool. When you said Belgium, uh, it reminded me of just Belgium chocolate, but yeah, that's, uh, that's another story. <laughs> um all right so this is from oh Jaden again i think okay yeah so what would be the best investment in your eyes at around one thousand dollars in pokemon cards <laughs> in your eyes obviously so this is not like this is his opinion guys so you don't have to worry if you can find a psa 8 charizard from the base set an unlimited one for a thousand go and buy that you got a thousand dollars. Don't buy anything. Don't, <laughs> don't buy anything. Just that. Yeah. Fair enough. I you get a PSA eight one for uh, for a thousand now. I think they're still going for about a thousand. Yeah. yeah. I know a PSA nine is going for like nearly two grand or eighteen hundred something like that. So yeah, PSA eight is probably half of that. So yeah. Okay. Not a bad. Hundred percent. It's Charizard. It's base set. Yeah. Why not? It's a thousand dollars. Okay, so um, this is Arthur. How is being a middleman for grading? I know several middlemen that burn out simply due to PSA turnaround times and numerous questions about each sub. How do you manage all that? And are you looking to expand to something like Ludkins? Um, ties into a bit of uh, the, the other question that we got, whether mm -hmm. I wanted to see this go further. And I mean, the potential's there to do that. Um, I think Ludkins is, you know, about 50 times uh, the size of what we do. But, I mean, having something similar like that, Australian-based, would be would be very good. You do see often the tags that I get tagged in for people looking for middlemen. 
and they are directed to send their cards there, which is which is fair and reasonable because they're the best at what they do. But it also means just sending them away to America mm. to be sent to somewhere else in America. And it's sort of like another reason why I do what I do. It's like, well, hang on, let's just go straight to PSA um, and spend the money we need to spend so that everything's done safely and so on and so forth. I mean, their track record is you know, just speaks for itself. They've submitted millions of cards for people, but, um, you know, dividing and, and having other options in the market is a good thing. Um, if I had have kept going the way that I was going early on without systems in place to make things easier and, and areas where people could look at um, information and how to do things, I would have been stuffed probably, yeah. It was becoming quite... I would have maybe 30 or 40 messages um, on Messenger in the morning. Um, and it was it was tough because you want to reply to everyone, uh, mm. but also there were some mornings where I was like, oh, no, I can't do it. I can't talk to everyone again today. Um, but we we looked at it and thought, well, how can we help people so that not necessarily that they don't have to message me because they always can, but there's areas where they can go get answers to their questions. And that's why we had the videos. Um, uh, we've, we've got the how-to guides and certain things like that. Um, the pricing is all there in the announcements. And yeah. So it's definitely taken the heat off. Um, and if I feel like it's, you know, we've got too many cards or things are potentially going to be really hectic. I'll just pause. Like I'll message the, the group and just say, listen, um, please don't send anything for the next week. Um, while I consolidate what we've got and then I'll let you know when you can start sending again. Fair enough. Yeah, that's good. Sounds like that works out really well for you and for everyone else as well. Um, nobody wants you to burn out and, leave us you know <laughs> uh and it'd be nice to have something like the size of ludkins in australia as well because um i think we need that we need that here um i think it'd be cool the market is definitely enough here in australia where i mean so much business does go their way and and deservedly so that's what they've prided themselves on but to have somewhere else in australia of that caliber would be would be really good really helpful <laughs> So who knows? Maybe it's you. The Hurricane Collective. Represent. <laughs> Hashtag Hurricane Collective, guys. Um, all right. So this one's from Sean. Ask Mac if he wants an apprentice. <laughs> Do you want an apprentice? When, when can he start? <laughs> <laughs> all right. Uh, well, we'll have to ask him that. So where can, when can he start? All right. Um, Steph says, this is fantastic. Sam, definitely ask about razors and pricing. Can get a good hour or two from that alone. I think this has already gone for an hour, so I don't know. But what, what's your thoughts on razors and pricing stuff? Yep. So razors um, or, you know, raffles as they're called, it's definitely something that seems from Australian standpoint and especially on facebook that they have been uh, the community seems to be trying to steer away from them mm. uh, i think people are getting a bit annoyed that the fact that people may put up um old mate rookie card here he's worth 100 but they might be charging a total cost for entry of 200 and i think people for a while were sort of okay with that because it was a bit of you know, I might get a chance to win that card. And at the end of the day, it's, it's just gambling. That's all it is. And if that's what people want to do, you know, they're adults, that's fine. I, I personally don't have any issue with people doing it, but um, it does affect prices of stuff because um, people don't know how to price a certain card if it's razzing at 300 and it's sold on eBay for 100 and you and I do a deal for 150, where do we go? Like, um, it's not going to go away. And, and I don't have an opinion on whether it should or shouldn't. Um, I know a lot of really good people who, who conduct their business really well um, on, on other mediums and, and 
are extremely trustworthy and they, and they provide the opportunity for people to, um, to get a Yeah. To possibly win a card cheap. Yeah. Yep. Product that they would never see otherwise. Um, and, and that's fantastic. But, um, I think, uh, it's, it's not going to go away. Yeah. It does affect prices, but, um, you know, everyone's, we've still got some freedoms left. So, you know, if people want to enter, if people want to enter raffles uh, while they're still around, you know, yeah, really fair call. Fair enough. Um, please. All right. This is from Ben. Please let me know what his lounge room looks like. Are you able to turn the camera around? <laughs> yeah. So once again, the, uh, the joke around the fact that I used to operate out of a lounge room because I do have a, a couch in the floor where people can actually come in and sort of go through certain cards um, in different binders and whatnot. Um, the old school sort of, um, you know, collectible side of things where they can come and trade things as well. And um, we also generally do videos from the couch, but, um, the reception's not that great. And um, when we do flesh and blood learn to play, that's where we um, we sit and we go through the game in the, in that section as well. But I was actually, um, the joke started because uh, I was reported to my suppliers um, <laughs> and someone like rang them and said that I was doing all my business from a house. <laughs> <laughs> I had all these phone calls one morning from the suppliers, like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm in my office. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah. So someone actually yeah. rang your suppliers or wow. Uh, they rang me. So, uh, you know, they were informed by someone that supposedly that's what I was doing, but it was all cleared up, you know, and they were doing their job, giving yeah. me a call, wow. but the joke never gone away. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, <laughs> so Nate, this is from Nathan. Uh, uh, once again, please find out if he has an actual store or if he just does his consultations from the toilet. All right. So I think we Thanks, clarified Nate. that. Uh, I didn't see the toilet there, but yeah. Um, <laughs> all right. Did he ever find his wallet? Zach says. Oh, yes. See, I had a, a day where I was meant to be sending off submissions um, to PSA. Everything was packaged. And I lost my wallet the morning that FedEx was picking up the stuff and it was just, yeah, chaos. And, um, yeah, a lot of people sort of knew cause I went on and did a live sort of, you know, update for people like, you know, bear with me. I'm trying to find my wallet and I was all pissed and everything. But... Out of that. Yeah, of course. Anybody would be, it's a wallet. It's important. Um, Somebody, <laughs> which was good. Yeah. Well, at least you got it back. So yeah, that's good. Um, this is Herman, how to pull an SCR from every box. Uh, Herman and I just did, um, a trade, uh, which was, which was really good. Um, and, uh, it, it allowed me to, um, have some new Dragon Ball super boxes, uh, that we did a live opening of last night and pretty much every box had like a secret rare in it. Rare. So <laughs> he, uh, wants to know how, how we did that. Yeah. We, and and yeah, they're not always lucky. guaranteed in the in the box, is it? Like no, yeah. It was, it was too. It, it makes me really happy when um, people enter like the breaks and they get the good cards because you see a lot of breaks happen where um, and and I've had breaks where I've opened cards for people and when they don't get something good, it's sort of like oh, sorry. I know, but it's also not your fault too. So um, <laughs> it's luck of the draw. But uh, anyway, that is all the questions from Facebook and all the questions that I had. Um, anything else you want to say before we go? <laughs> thanks, thanks for taking the time to chat. It's been a pleasure. And um, yeah, look, if anyone wants to um, fire any more questions off, man, happy to chat with you anytime. Well, thank you so much for coming, Mac. And um, you know, I do appreciate your time and, you know, your passion for what you do. Uh, definitely you're going to see a lot more of my cards come to you and uh, hopefully many more people as well. And um, yeah, I think we'll call it an end. <laughs>
uh, and I'll speak to you soon. Thanks, guys. Have a good one. Bye.